Imagine stepping onto a train in Washington, D.C., and stepping off in Dallas just nine hours later. Or traveling from Paris to Athens in the same amount of time, a single workday transformed into a cross-continental journey. In most parts of the world, that would sound impossible. Trains simply don't move that fast, and distances that vast are the domain of airplanes. But in China, it's already reality. In September 2018, China unveiled one of its proudest infrastructure feats, a high-speed rail link connecting Hong Kong to Beijing. The route covers roughly the same distance as Washington to Dallas or Paris to Athens, yet the journey takes less than nine hours. Eight hours and 56 minutes to be exact. It's a symbol of how far the country has come in an astonishingly short time. Because just a decade earlier, in 2008, China's high-speed rail network barely existed. At the time of the Beijing Olympics, the entire network consisted of a short 19-mile maglev line linking Shanghai's airport to the city's outskirts and a modest high-speed route between Beijing and Tianjin. Fast forward 10 years, and the transformation is almost unimaginable. From a few hundred kilometers of track, China built the largest high-speed rail network the world has ever seen. The scale is staggering. China now has eight times more high-speed rail than France, 10 times more than Japan, 20 times more than the United Kingdom, and nearly 500 times more than the United States. In total, China's network spans more distance than every other country's high-speed rail combined. Traditionally, high-speed rail systems thrived in wealthy, compact nations – Japan, France, Germany. These countries had the money, the density, and the political will to connect their major cities with fast trains. China, on paper, fit none of those conditions. It's enormous, roughly the same size as the United States, and still classified as a middle-income country. While its wealth has grown dramatically, China remains less affluent than most nations with comparable infrastructure. Its GDP per capita is closer to that of Mexico, Thailand, or Brazil. Yet somehow, it has built and maintained a high-speed network that rivals, and surpasses, anything the rich world has managed. How? The answer lies in the country's population density and geography. While China's western half is vast and sparsely populated, the eastern half is packed with cities, hundreds of millions of people living in relatively close proximity. Here, rail makes sense. Take Guangzhou and Changsha, for instance, cities about 350 miles apart. A flight takes roughly one hour. But when you add airport security, check-in lines, boarding, and the drive to and from the airport, that advantage quickly vanishes. The high-speed train covers the same distance in just over two hours, city center to city center, for a lower fare and far less stress. Even on longer routes, where trains typically lose their edge, China's system remains competitive. Beijing to Shanghai, a journey of about 650 miles, takes just four and a half hours by train. By comparison, Paris to Barcelona, a shorter distance, takes more than six hours on Europe's high-speed network. That difference has reshaped how people move. Between Beijing and Shanghai, there are roughly 50 flights a day, but 41 high-speed trains as well. Each train can carry over a thousand passengers, making rail the dominant form of travel between the two megacities. In Europe, the opposite is true. Budget airlines offer dirt-cheap flights, sometimes as little as $12 from Paris to Barcelona, making air travel the obvious choice for many. In China, low-cost airlines are far less prevalent, and air travel is notoriously inefficient. China's three largest airlines, China Southern, China Eastern, and Air China, suffer from some of the worst on-time records in the world. Their average punctuality rates hover between 63 and 67%. One major reason is military control of airspace. Only about 30% of China's skies are open to civilian aircraft. This forces commercial planes into narrow corridors, creating bottlenecks and frequent delays. So while a flight between Beijing and Shanghai may take only two hours in the air, 
Unpredictable delays often stretch total travel time to nearly as long as the train, but without the comfort or convenience. That's part of why rail has become China's transportation backbone. Still, not every high-speed project in China makes sense on paper. Take the Lanzhou Urumqi Line, opened in 2014. It stretches across nearly a thousand miles of desert and mountains, linking two mid-sized cities of around three and a half million people each, with very little in between. By Western logic, it's a financial black hole. Building the line cost roughly $20 billion. Even if every seat on every train were filled for decades, tickets would need to cost about $400 each way, just to recover construction costs in 30 years. In reality, they cost about $80, and ridership remains modest. Revenue doesn't even cover electricity expenses, let alone maintenance or debt. So why build it at all? The answer lies beyond economics, in politics and control. Urumqi is the capital of Xinjiang, a region where the majority of the population belongs to the Uyghur ethnic group. For years, Beijing has faced resistance there, protests, violence, and a deep cultural divide. The central government's strategy has long been to integrate Xinjiang more tightly with the rest of China, both economically and socially. High-speed rail became a tool for that mission. By linking Xinjiang to major Chinese cities, Beijing hoped to foster what they call ethnic unity. That's the official term used in state documents. It's not a new tactic. In Tibet, long seen as a symbol of defiance to central authority, the government built a 47-hour rail link connecting Lhasa to Beijing. It's the world's highest railway, climbing to an elevation of over 16,600 feet, where passengers breathe through oxygen supplies to counter the thin air. The symbolism is clear steel tracks binding remote, restive regions to the political heart of the country. Even the Hong Kong connection serves a similar purpose. Although Hong Kong operates under the one country, two systems framework, its growing physical and infrastructural integration with the mainland reflects Beijing's long-term goal, deeper unity under one flag. When the high-speed station opened in Hong Kong, controversy erupted. Part of the station was designated as mainland port area, effectively placing it under Chinese jurisdiction. To some Hong Kongers, it wasn't just a train terminal, it was a statement of sovereignty. Regardless of motive, China's high-speed rail network has fundamentally reshaped the nation. It's making the vast country feel smaller, economically, socially, even psychologically. Compare that to the United States, where plans for high-speed rail have moved at a glacial pace. California's proposed San Francisco-Los Angeles line, for example, has been under development for over a decade. It's expected to cost around $77 billion and cover 520 miles, translating to about $148 million per mile. China, by contrast, builds for roughly $30 million per mile. That's one-fifth the cost. Lower labor costs explain part of it, but efficiency plays a bigger role. China has turned high-speed construction into an industrial process, kind of like an assembly line of infrastructure. Standardized designs, mass-produced viaducts, and streamlined logistics allow for enormous speed and cost savings. What once took Europe or Japan decades, China achieves in a fraction of the time. But more than cost or technology, China's advantage lies in something far less tangible political will. Where many democracies wrestle with debates, lawsuits, and environmental reviews that stretch for years, China's centralized system pushes projects from blueprint to reality in record time. Once the leadership sets a priority, right, like high-speed rail, the machinery of the state moves with almost unstoppable momentum. It's not without downsides. Critics argue that the same speed and control that make construction efficient can also stifle local voices and overlook environmental concerns. But the results are undeniable. In little more than a decade, China connected its major cities with rails that rival the world's best, and in many ways, surpassed them. 
For millions of ordinary Chinese citizens, high-speed rail isn't about politics or global prestige. It's about opportunity. Trains have become lifelines linking affordable suburbs to the economic hubs of Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. People who once couldn't dream of working in China's most expensive cities can now commute daily, thanks to trains that cut multi-hour journeys down to minutes. An estimated 75 million people can now reach Shanghai within an hour by high-speed rail. That's equivalent to the entire population of Germany within commuting distance of one city. These connections are expanding China's megacities even further, fueling productivity and growth. And while some routes may never be profitable on a spreadsheet, the social return in carbon reduction, reduced congestion, and human mobility is enormous. A study of California's proposed rail project found that benefits like lower emissions and fewer road accidents would be worth about $440 million annually, almost exactly the amount it would need in subsidies to break even. In China, the government accepts that trade-off without hesitation. Profit is secondary to purpose. Yet, the experiment is far from over. China's network keeps expanding westward into regions where populations are sparse and returns uncertain. Stations for smaller cities are often built miles from their urban centers, a 45-minute drive in some cases, raising questions about long-term viability. Still, each new track represents more than just a train route. It's a strand in the web of a nation being rewoven in real time, physically, economically, and ideologically. When future historians look back at the early 21st century, they may see China's high-speed rail not just as an engineering triumph, but as a defining expression of national ambition. A country that once struggled to connect its people has, in a single generation, stitched itself together with steel and motion. From the deserts of Xinjiang to the skyscrapers of Shanghai, from the plateaus of Tibet to the bustling streets of Hong Kong, the rhythm of modern China now runs on rails. The trains don't just move people, they carry a message that in the race between distance and destiny, China has chosen to move faster.